All right. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? All right. All right. Thank you. Um, hope everybody's having a blessed Sunday. So like Alap said, we'll be continuing our uh, series on the life of St. Paul. So today we will be uh, discussing grace, uh, which is one of the virtues that St. Paul uh, discusses heavily. So I pray that God opens all of our hearts and allows me and all of us to be receptive to today's message. And I pray that God uses me as a vessel to deliver today's uh, message. So if you guys recall, uh, by the way, can you guys see the screen? Yeah, okay. If you guys recall, the theme verse for this, uh, this series is what? It's right on the board. So let's all say it together. Say it again. Is I? Yep, so 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. So the, um, the goal of picking this verse for our series of course, the goal is to be like Christ, right? Uh, but at times, some people might see Christ and say, okay, uh, or they might get discouraged and say, how can I be perfect, you know? And they might fall into despair or other things. So the goal of it is to see somebody like St. Paul that went through many different struggles and relate with that struggles. So a lot of us go through different uh, infirmities, different sins, different struggles, different weaknesses. And the goal of picking St. Paul and imitating St. Paul, uh, of course, ultimately is because he imitated Christ. But the goal of picking him as somebody to imitate is because we relate on a lot of ways as far as the infirmities. Um, and that's what the goal of like, reading a lot of church uh, father commentary, uh, the life of the saints, uh, the life of the church fathers. The goal is to find something in their life, some struggle that they had in their life that we also have. So. Uh, ultimately, of course, the goal is to be like Christ. Uh, like Christ said, be holy as I am holy, right? So the mark, the goal is Christ. Um, but there's different ways as far as um, different church fathers that are relatable that we can get there. So we'll be starting talking about uh, grace. What is grace? We'll look at a few examples of grace in the Bible. Um, and then specifically what this grace looks like in St. Paul's life. Um, and then lastly, we'll wrap up by looking at what is expected of us or how do we invite this grace that St. Paul talks about within our life? How do we invite the divine grace of God within our life? So I want to start with this verse before we define grace. I want to start with this verse from John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as if the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, starting off, it's important for us to understand God is full of grace. God is full of grace and full of truth. And we also call the Virgin Mary full of grace. Um, in our, uh, we just did in our, uh, in our, our Father prayer. Um, we call her full of grace because God is in her, right? So we said, oh, you who is full of grace, for the Lord is with you. So just within that prayer, you see the definition of grace. Oh, you who is full of grace, God is with you. So what's the definition of grace? God being present in your life, right? So that will be our starting definition for grace. The presence of God within your life, or the power of God. And this grace that we speak of is a free gift from God. It's a free gift from God, an unearned or unmerited, un, uh, unwarranted gift from God. And this gift is the power, the grace of God, or the, yeah, the power of God within your life. Um, and it's, it goes much deeper than that, right? So it's not just the power of God within your life, this grace, but this grace is our means for salvation. It's through this grace that we're saved. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, <clears throat> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the highlighted portion, by grace you have been saved through faith. So it's God's grace that allows us to be saved. And even from our creation, from our beginning, uh, from the inception of mankind, God had grace in our creation. Right? It's grace, God's grace that allowed us to be created to begin with. 
right? Because when you think about it, there's no reason for us to be created or to be on this earth other than because of God's grace, right? Out of his love, out of his compassion, out of his mercy, and out of him wanting to, for us to have a relationship with him. That's the whole point of our creation, and that's the whole point of why we're here. And after that highlighted portion, it says, and that not of yourselves, right? So when we talk about grace, it's important for us to understand there's nothing within, uh, within our life that can justify God's grace within our life. Right. So at no point will you be able to say, OK, I've done blank. I deserve X amount of God's grace. Uh, I've done this. I deserve this amount. I've done this. I don't deserve grace. So as we go through, that's a theme that I'll constantly repeat. But keep that in mind as we go through today's uh, sermon. Um, a good way to understand different uh, teachings within our church, different uh, uh, yeah, theological teachings or just any uh, concept within our church is to look at the history of the church. So one great thing about orthodoxy uh, is that it's apostolic in that it started from the, from the apostles, right? So uh, there's a lot of uh, church father teachings, patristic writings that we can reference for anything that we like. And there's a lot of heretical teachings that we can go back uh, where certain concept, for example, like grace, were challenged by different teachers. And this is a great way because, you know, oftentimes, let's say you're in a classroom, somebody raises their hand and asks the, the professor a question that you don't have, but then once they ask you, you're like, okay, this is a question that, like, that I've been thinking the whole time, right? Um, so for grace, we'll look at, uh, to better understand it, we'll look at this heresy, Pelagianism heresy in the 5th century. So Pelagius, all you need to know about him is he was a monk in the 5th century. And then as far as his teachings, his teachings revolved around the idea of uh, original sin, human free will, or human nature, and then grace. So we'll start with his teaching on original sin, and then we'll tie it back to how that relates to grace. So as far as original sin, he rejected the idea of original sin to begin with. So in our church, we believe that Adam and Eve sinned, and as a result of this sin from Adam and Eve, the descendants of Adam and Eve, and the succession of descendants, including us, we inherit that original sin, right? So he rejected this. Um, we believe that we, re we uh, inherited this original sin, which is the whole point of one of the things, uh, reasons why we get baptized, right? If you guys remember in the sacraments course we just had, one of the reasons is to get rid of this original sin. The other is to be adopted children of God and to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So he rejected this idea. And as we see in uh, Romans 5.12, this is directly against uh, teachings of our church where it says, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Right, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So moving on to his second teaching, as far as free will or human nature. So when we speak of grace, we need to understand that everything within us, every good thing within us is from God. Every good thing within us is from God. So Pelagius' teachings with regards to the free will or human nature is, he was saying that as humans, we're able to, we have the capability of picking good from evil. We have the capability of being righteous on our own accord, like without God. That's, that was his teaching, right? And the issue with this is that if you as, a, as a, a man or woman are able to pick or be righteous in your life without God, then it, it takes out the need for God, right? It takes out the need for God for our salvation, for uh, us to be united with him in his heavenly kingdom, right? It takes out his involvement. Right? So it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. So nothing we did merited the grace of God. And the problem with this is that it removes God's involvement in our salvation. And this, uh, another verse that kind of drives that point home is from Romans chapter 5, 18 and 19. Through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. 
referring to Christ. Through the obedience of man, one man, many will be made righteous. So this just shows that it's nothing that we did that made us who we are. It's through the grace of God. And then lastly, as far as his teachings on grace, he believed that, um, like earlier, like we just read, we said, the grace of God is the means to our salvation, right? That's what we just said. So he believed that this grace, it's good, but it's not necessary for you to become, uh, for you to be like good, for you to stay away from sin. So kind of one in the same as far as free will, where he believed that man by himself can do good. The grace of God can assist, but man by himself can do good. And obviously, like we just read, this is uh, against teachings of our church, right? So St. Paul talks more about uh, this power, the, the power of grace and its ability to transform. Um, and it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So he says, having all sufficiency in all things. So St. Paul here is saying, this grace from God is sufficient for everything. So this grace for God is the solution for everything. Right? He's sufficient in all things in his life because of the grace of God. The solution to all his problems, the solution to all our problems, is the grace of God. And within our church, everything we do, all of the prayers, uh, the sata, the kidan, everything is to help invite this grace of God within our lives. It's asking God to pour his grace in our hearts and to transform our hearts and our minds just like St. Paul and many other people. And this grace is not uh, deserved. It's undeserved and not earned. So earlier we said undeserved, meaning there's nothing we can do to, to merit it. It's also not earned. And you, he made, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked according to the course of this world and were by the nature children of wrath just as the others. So this shows our state. St. Paul is kind of describing the process of the working of grace within our life. So initially where we were, he's saying initially we were dead in trespasses as a result of our sins, as a result of our transgressions and our own actions. So initially we were dead. And then he goes on to say, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even, if, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So he brought us from being dead in our trespasses, in our consequent, the consequence of our own actions, to being alive. So from dead to alive, right? So think of it, um, think of it as, a, for example, a car, right? A car that's obsolete, old, 30 years old, no longer working, engine's broken. Just imagine that you replaced it with a new, uh, what is it, a new engine, and then now it's suddenly like operational and functional, and then you can drive it, right? But, but grace is even beyond this, right? Um, St. Paul goes on to say, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus, that in the age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Sit together in the heavenly places. So not only did it bring us from being dead, but elevated us so much to being sitting in the heavenly places. So using that same car example, it's, it's as if you uh, got this old car that's no longer functional, no longer working, uh, engine is broken, you replace it with a new engine, you brought it alive, but you elevate it even more than it previously was by you know, adding new tires, new rims, new, uh, new paint job, all of that, right? So. He talks a little bit about God's grace and ability to transform us. It's not just a matter of bring, alivening us, right? But it's a matter of allowing us to sit in the heavenly places next to him. So, another example of grace is imagine... Uh, Let's say you're in DC, right? Let's say, let's say you're near here, Gabriel. Um, you're parked, your car's parked, and suddenly somebody hits your car and like runs off. A few people are laughing because somebody happened, that happened to somebody here. But uh, let's say your car is hit and the person runs off, right? Now, what's your initial reaction? 
I don't know about y'all, but my initial reaction is like, like I'll be boiling, like I'll be like, let me go get them, I need to, I don't know what I need to do, but I need to find them and inflict some sort of pain on them because they like, they messed up my car, right? And then you cool off and then like you might call the police. <laughs> and then you cool off, you might call the police. And um, that would be what, that would be justice, right? So initially you were at vengeance, you wanted to typically wear eye for an eye, like somebody uh, hit me, I wanna hit them back, right? So initially you were at vengeance, now you call the police, you cooled off a little bit, and that would, that would be uh, justice. And then ultimately you go to court, and um, <laughs> ultimately you go to court, and you see this person, this perpetrator um, there, and he's like pleading for, he's pleading, and he's saying, sorry, you know, I have kids, I'm so sorry I did it, and like he's just begging you, right? So ultimately you drop these charges. So this would be called what? Not grace, but mercy. This would be called mercy. So grace, within this example, as crazy as it would be, grace in this example, that for the person that hit you, would be finding them. Finding them, changing their car, changing their tires for them, getting them a car wash. I know it sounds ridiculous. I see a few of you laughing. Um, and promising them, I'll continue changing oil for the rest of, until you get a new car. And then the new car, I'll change that oil too. So it's the equivalence of that. So that's, we laugh because it's so ridiculous, but that's what grace is, right? Grace is ridiculous. Grace is not bound by our human understanding. It's not something that we see or uh, exhibit, uh, I don't think, within our friendships, within our life, right? So it's not giving us what we deserve. So it's not giving us what we deserve and then giving us something we can never earn. Right, so it's, it's beyond any understanding that we could have. It's ridiculous, right? Um, a verse that I often like struggled with and I would read uh, Romans 5.20. It says, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. And this is also in our uh, Monday uh, Udasi Mayan prayer as well, where it says, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. Now, as we read this verse, it, when I first I had to read it like, a few times to understand because it, it, like, it doesn't fit into any sort of logic that we know, right? So if it said, you know, where good deeds abounded, uh, grace abounded, it, it makes sense. Like, you did good deeds, you warrant grace, right? Or if it said, where sin abounded, death abounded, that makes sense. You, you sin, you die, right? But it's saying, it's saying the complete opposite. But that's, that's what grace is. Like, it defies any uh, human understanding. Um, so grace is not giving us what we deserve and then giving us something that we can never earn. So imagine you're, uh, a lot of you here are in college, high school, imagine you're preparing for an exam, right? You prepare for this exam, uh, it's the biggest exam of your college career, high school career, and you get to the exam, you open it, and like, this is something that you've been studying for nearly three, four months, right? You open it and you realize you don't, you know, you, you flip through it, you don't know what, you don't know anything there. So you start from the front, you don't know it. You know, typically we go to the back, you don't know it. You're like, all right, let me start from the middle now. And then at that point you start, you know, you start losing hope. So you take this exam and uh, a week later the professor hands it back to you. And it's filled with red marks. You know, if it's filled with red marks, you know you didn't pass. So it's filled with red marks and you notice that you, you didn't get anything right. So it's all X's, you didn't get anything right. But it, when you flip to the front, in a big circle, it says 127%. It says 127%. You didn't get anything right, but you got an A+. Plus. Now, going back to what we said, grace is not giving us what we deserve. So in that case, you didn't get anything right. What did you deserve? A zero, right? But it's also not giving us something we can never earn. You got 127%, right? If you studied all your life, you will never get 127%. So meaning, there's nothing that you could have studied to get that 127%. It's also not what you, uh, it's giving us what we, not giving us what we deserve, you didn't get that zero, and not giving us something you can never earn. You can never earn that 127%. It just, mathematically, is impossible, right? But that's, that's what grace is. Now, I'm not by any means encouraging you to not study. You will fail. Um, and St. Paul talks a lot about uh, grace in his life and how through God's grace, he was able to be transformed. And looking at St. Paul, it should really encourage us 
and give us hope knowing that if somebody in that condition became a vessel for God, if somebody in that condition was able to be persecuted for God, right? He went from killing Christians or persecuting Christians to dying for, for the name of Christ, right? So if somebody in that position can have that complete 180, that, that should give us hope knowing that it, God can do it for us too. Right, as we know, he's a persecutor of Christians. And he had an encounter with God where God asked him, why are you persecuting me? And then he immediately was baptized and then started his missionary work and then started preaching the gospel, preaching the good news. So he's a great example of the power of God's grace and how it's able to transform um, all of our lives. So when we read this, we shouldn't read it as uh, a fictional uh, or historical uh, character, but put ourselves in the shoes of St. Paul. Uh, replace killing Christians with some, with some other thing that we're struggling with. And then re literally replace your name, wherever it says Paul, just re or I, replace it with your own name. Like leave a blank or replace it with your own name and read it, as if you're the one in that story. And he att attributes this uh, good works, this uh, transformation uh, of his life to God. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, But God had mercy on me, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience, with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Then others will, receive, will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. So, St. Paul, he also calls himself the chief of sinners. Like, the first, like, so if there's a line of sinners, literally the first one, so like, the head of heads of sinners. And the goal of that isn't just for the sake of calling uh, himself that, it's for us. He calls himself the chief of sinners, so that we can look at it and say, okay, if he's the chief of sinners, then we're below that, so God can, God can have mercy on us, right? So it's to motivate us, to give us uh, hope. Now, when we understand this grace of God and the power of God within our lives, we, you know, with anything, you want to, like if somebody shows you love, you want to reciprocate that love, right? You want to show that love back, right? And the more we grow in the grace of God, the more we want to spread it, the more you uh, respond, respond to God more powerfully, right? Whether it be in service, whether it be in prayer, in uh, anything that you do. Right? Not just within the church, but outside of the church, you, you're, you want to respond more powerfully. You want to um, stir up the grace of God. As it says in 2 Timothy verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, Therefore I remind you that stir up the gift of God which is in you by the laying of my hands. Uh, I want to read a commentary that really drives this point home from John Chrysostom uh, as far as this specific um, uh, verse from Timothy. It says, Is it up there? Okay. For it requires much zeal to stir up the gift of God. As fire requires fuel, so grace requires our alacrity or eagerness, that it may be fervent, for it is in our power to kindle or extinguish this grace. So he's saying, this grace that we're speaking of, it is from God, it is unmerited, unjustified, unwarranted, but it's up to us to receive this grace. It's up to us to invite this grace of God within our life. All right. So he continues to say, for by the sloth carelessness it is quenched, and by watchfulness and diligence it is kept alive. For it is you indeed, but you must render it more vehement. That is, fill it with confidence, with joy and delight, stand manfully. So now that we've defined grace, its ability to transform, its uh, ability to transform in not just all of our lives, but or not just St. Paul's life, but all of our lives as well, and we've kind of went through that, let's look at what is expected of us, right? What is our response to this grace that we see from God? So the first one, or the first way that we can invite the grace of God within our lives is through repentance. Our, our church re uh, preaches repentance 24 seven days, uh, 24 hours, a, seven days a week, every day of the year, right? And everything we do should be so that our actions should be led to repentance, to confession. 
right? And no single thing we can do within our lives will unleash or invite the grace of God within our life more than repentance or confession. So it says in chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't say if you overcome this sin that you're struggling with, if you uh, defeat it or it's no longer in you, but if you confess it, right? It's not, about a matter, it's not a matter of if you are going to fall again, because most likely you will, right? But it's about at that moment, in that second, am I giving my heart to God and having a contrite heart like King David and repentant tears like St. Peter? And am I willing, in that, just in that moment, I don't have to decide for the rest of my life if, I'm gonna, if I want to continue struggling with it, right? But just in that moment, do I want to open my heart to God and do I uh, want to, you know, have a contrite heart and confess my sins. Now, will this repentance solve all your problems? I don't know. But without this repentance, will, be, will they be solved? Definitely not. So that you can guarantee. So the second one is humility. So humility is, um, think of it as a precursor to God's grace. Right? You can do anything within the church. You can be uh, involved... Uh, with grand services or anything like that, but if you don't have humility, you're just, you're just tiring yourself out because you're, it's like you're actively blocking the grace of God, especially because you're so involved, in like let's say you're involved in all the prayers and the services and everything, and you're running around, but if you lack humility, it, it, it negates all of those works, right? So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So that's the second thing. The third is not to receive God's grace uh, with vain, in vain. Not to receive God's grace in vain. So St. Paul urges us this in 2 Corinthians 6.1. He says, Well then, as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, this grace that we're speaking of, don't think that God's grace is all it takes for you to be reconciled with God. Don't think it's just grace that it takes. Now, going back to what we were talking about earlier, earlier we said there's, no, there's nothing you can do on your part to merit this grace, right? So these two things, keep in mind, they don't cancel each other out. So it's undeserved and un, not unearned. But that doesn't mean you just sit there and wait for God's grace to come into play, right? So there still needs to be works in your life to invite God's grace in your life. So there's... Oftentimes when it comes to faith and works, there's like polar opposites that people often resort to. Um, so for example, on one side people say, okay, it's just faith only, right? Where it's just God's grace, um, no works of my own in order to invite God's grace in my life. So they just sit there without any, any work of their own and they wait for God's grace, right? And oftentimes, this is where we have heavy disagreements with like Protestants, where they simply say, there's no works that's needed for, your God, for God's grace. Now, when we speak of God's grace, or when we speak of works, we're not saying these works merit God's grace, but we're simply saying there needs to be, uh, you need to return to God in order for him to return to you. Like, like it says Zechariah, he says, return to me, and I will return to you, right? And then on the other side, where we say, uh, the other polar extreme of that is where it's works only. And oftentimes on this side, it's where we have this mentality of we want to control God's grace. Where, okay, I've done, okay, I've been good today, so I deserve this amount of grace. And I've, you know, I've done this, so I deserve a little bit more grace. Where God's grace doesn't, it's, it doesn't add up. It doesn't, it's not bound by the laws of math, right? Like we said earlier, you got 127%. You can never earn 127%, right? So it's not bound by math. So you can never say, I did one, I deserve... Uh, one, one more, one grace, one amount of unit of grace from God, right? So it's not like a vending machine where, you know, um, you put a dollar in, you click F2, and then you get chips, right? Because um, when you think about it, you keep going back to that vending machine, you put a dollar in, you get chips. Next time you put a dollar in, and you don't get the chips, right? So logically, what would, it, what would you do? You try, you bang it, you shake it back and forth, you yank it, it doesn't come out. So you put another dollar in and it doesn't come out again, 
Now, any sane person would say, okay, this vending machine obviously broken, so let me walk away. If we do that with God, then we're setting us up for failure because we're saying God is like a vending machine where anything we ask, like a genie, anything we plead, he will give it to us. The fourth thing that's expected of us is, now all four of these are kind of one in the same, but I just wanted, I just broke it up to kind of drive the point home, is to cooperate in our own healing. To cooperate in our own healing. So, we are the patient, and God is a doctor, but we have to want to be healed to be healed. Like we have to still go to the doctor office. We still have to sign the forms. We still have to say, tell the doctor, okay, do the surgery on me. We, have to, we still have to pick which surgery, surgery we want. But it's not us who heals it, it's God, of course, but we still have to decide to want to be healed. Right? If we look at uh, the story of David and Goliath, when David defeated Goliath, uh, 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 47, it says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into your hands. So he's saying, initially he, had, he acknowledges, the battle is the Lord's. There's nothing that he, David, can do to defeat uh, uh, Goliath through his own works. But he didn't just sit there and say, the battle is the Lord's, close his eyes, and then poof, he disappeared, the Goliath disappeared, right? So he still picked up the stones. He still decided to, uh, to take the sword, right? So he still had to be strategic in how he was going to strike him. So, like we said earlier, a good verse, that, like a memory verse that we can keep in our hearts is from Zechariah, uh, where it says, Return to me, and I will return to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. Right? So now in this verse, it makes it seem like um, as I'm returning, like God, we're meeting God halfway, right? Or like I start walking back to God, I meet him halfway, and then he comes and meets me halfway, right? But in reality, the minute, the minute we even like have our mind set on God, the minute we start our path is towards God, the minute we even look back towards God, just like the prodigal son, he's coming out and running, uh, running towards us and greeting us, like the lost sheep, right? Now, going back to the life of St. Paul. So, uh, we know St. Paul had a sickness. As he's writing all of these um, epistles, he had a sickness, he had a chronic illness, like an ailment, that, like a physical ailment that prevented him, uh, not prevented him, but like that inhibited him uh, at times and, you know, was a struggle for him. And I won't go into detail as far as what it is, but like some people say it was uh, epilepsy, uh, like uh, present day it would be uh, diagnosed as epilepsy, uh, where, or severe seizures, or anything like that. But uh, for now, let's just say epilepsy. You know, uh, that's one of the th illnesses that they said he had. Uh, now, St. Paul, he pleaded with God. He asked God, please take this away from me, this sickness this ailment, this uh, pain, he's asking God to take it away from me. It says, concerning this, I plead with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, out of all of us, you would think this grace of God would have been, uh, or God would have heard uh, St. Paul's prayer and assisted him and removed this ailment from him, right? But that, like we said earlier, that's not how gra uh, grace works. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. Just because we ask for it, it's not about the amount of times we plead. It's not about the amount of times we've been good. God responds to St. Paul. St. Paul pleads with him, and he says, God, please remove this away from me. And God responds to him and said, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. This is God speaking to uh, St. Paul. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weaknesses. In weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. So in other words, he said, no, I'm not going to remove this, this sickness, this ailment from you. Right? St. Paul did everything uh, right, but God is saying here, you're, you're not going to, uh, I'm not going to remove this weakness from you. Right? He asked God for physical healing, but God responds to say, my, my uh, grace is sufficient in all, everything, and that's all you need. 
And that's what God is telling us all the time. Right? Despite our infirmity, despite our weakness, a lot of times we think, okay, this weakness is inhibiting me from uh, becoming what God has destined, has me destined to be. But that's not the case. Listen, St. Paul is a prime example. He's saying, despite that weakness, you're still a vessel of God. Like, my grace is sufficient in your weakness. St. Paul responded to God saying, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So, once God tells him, my grace is all you need, he pleads with him. God tells him, my grace is all you need. And once he understood that, he does a complete 180 and says, okay. And he, one, one of the things is he accepts what God had to say. He didn't fight back or anything, right? He accepts it. And then he says, not only will I boast about these infirmities, but I'll take pleasure in, these weak, in this weakness of mine. Right? Whether it be epilepsy or whatever, I will take pleasure in this pain. And then he says, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Because he understood that God's grace is sufficient in all things for him. God's grace is all he needed uh, to be a vessel. And for all of us here, it should show us that just because God says, no, I'm not going to remove this thing from you, that doesn't mean we can't be vessels of God. Right? Just because the problem that we have is not solved, that doesn't mean we can't be... Uh, the, God, the grace of God can be poured within our hearts. Right? St. Paul asked God uh, for a physical healing, but he said, I'll give you something better. I'll give you inner peace. I'll give you spiritual healing. Right? And once he tasted the grace of God, he, he said, I'm good. I, I don't need anything more. So he didn't continue to, uh, to plead with God after that. So, the grace of God, like we said, isn't like a one-to-one -one thing where we do one and then we expect another unit of grace from God. Um, if we look at the example of the feeding of the 5,000, right? There definitely wasn't enough to feed everybody there. But there were still a few loaves of bread and a few uh, uh, fish pieces offered and God multiplied that. So we still have to cooperate in our own healing. We still have to put in the work and show God that we want to be healed. Right? Sometimes we get caught up in how, am, how is what God asks me going to get me from A to B? But it's like we're trying to play the part of God, right? Our, go our uh, response should be simply to do what A is, and God will get us to B. It, we don't have to worry about how we're going to get from A to B. Because we get caught up in how, how is this going to get me there, but we don't have to worry about that. That's, that's not our responsibility, that's God's. Right? So if we look at, uh, for example, the, um, uh, the sick man that was, uh, thir that was by the water for 30 plus years. He was by the water for 30 plus years, and there's a pool, uh, in the pool by the pool of Bethsaida, that's stirred by an angel. And every time whoever uh, enters that pool immediately will be healed. And similar to the, I think we can draw parallels between that and St. Paul's life where a lot of times we have a narrow way of looking at what the solution is, right? To that man, for 30 plus years, his solution is that water. That's the only way he's gonna get healed. And that's like, when God came up to him and said, do you wanna be healed? He's not thinking God's gonna heal me immediately. He's thinking, okay, he's gonna push me, he's gonna take me to the water, right? So he asked him, do you wanna be healed? So he cooperated in his own healing process and said yes. He didn't worry about, okay, how are you gonna take me? How are you gonna heal me? Um, what is the steps like? And, or anything like that, right? He, he just said yes. So similarly in our life, we have to lean into that discomfort and know that God is willing to take it. God is taking care of the rest. We just have to do our part, doing the four things we outlined, right? With the most important be starting with confession. So I pray that God pours His grace for all of us in all of our lives.
And I pray that we understand when he says, my grace is sufficient, I pray that we hear that voice. And we don't continue to plead on things that uh, are just the thing that God has put on us. And um, with that being said, glory be to God.